And so another chapter opens for Greece and for Europe. Alexei Tsipras winning the snap election he called after agreeing to harsh new bailout terms. When his Syriza party swept the board back in January, the anti-austerity camp across Europe pinned its hopes on a new movement that promised to draw a line in the sand against the terms imposed by Brussels, Berlin and the banks. In the end, after some high drama came compromise. Thus Tsipras lost a few comrades along the way, but won over some new voters who still see him as the only alternative to Greece's patronage politics of old. But did he get a better deal? What have we learned from the past nine months, particularly in places like Spain and the UK, where the hard left are on the rise, or here in France or Northern Europe, where the far right also hopes to cash in on the frustrations of voters? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the new Tsipras, and with us from Athens, economist Yanis Koutsoumidis. Many thanks for joining us again here in the France 24 debate. Thank you for having me. Also joining us Thank here in the studio, having me. Francesco Saracino, assistant uh, director of uh, the OFCE. Tell us what the OFCE is. It's a think tank associated with Sciences Po that with deals with macroeconomic policy, with the mostly with a science European science focus. Uh, we're also pleased to, to welcome uh, political and communications consultant uh, Pierre Jérôme Hénin. Of, uh, now, do we say, do we pronounce it the French way, Media Neuf, or is it Media Nine? What Media Neuf and Media Nine, if you want, also oh. both work. All right, and uh, all, as well, uh, he's a German entrepreneur who works here in Paris. Yep. Jakob Hasser, welcome back to the show. Uh, the uh, France Van Get Debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, or hashtag F24 Debate. Five elections in six years for the Greeks, and there's noticeably less drama, at least on the surface, uh, than last time around. Uh, the new coalition, okay, it's got slightly fewer seats in Parliament, 156 out of 300. That's compared to 162 in the previous Parliament, so the, a thinner margin. Uh, the same alliance between Syriza and the right-wing nationalist independent Greeks, much to the chagrin of uh, the center-right, uh, after polls predicted that new democracy had been running neck and neck. We faced a tough and difficult fight. And today I feel vindicated because the Greek people gave a clear mandate to us to continue our battle in and outside the country to raise our people's dignity. I'm really afraid that Mr Tsipras is not in a position and will not be in a position to guarantee the unity of his government and of his majority. And this is a reason which leads us to think that we have to be in a broad coalition. Yanis Koutsoumidis, uh, uh, two questions. First of all, uh, with this coalition government we're going to get come Wednesday, is it going to be a lot of familiar faces? And do you agree with uh, the statements we heard from that member of parliament from New Democracy that a grand coalition would have been better all around? Well, uh, we expect to have uh, almost uh, the same faces in the new government with a few changes. Uh, it's been uh, talk in town that uh, former uh, finance minister Mr. Tsakalotos will be in uh, the government, in the finance uh, ministry, and also the former economy minister Mr. Stathakis will be at the same ministry. Uh, what is uh, interesting now is uh, we have a new landscape in Greece. We have all major pro-European parties supporting the bailout agreement in uh, contrast to the January elections where both Syriza and the independent Greeks were against the bailout. So all major European parties, the Conservatives, the centre-right, the centrists, the socialists and Syriza and the independent Greeks are pro-European. So we have a vast majority of pro-European parties in the parliament. The problem is uh, now in nuances. There will have to be new reform bills uh, passed through the parliament in the next six to seven weeks. And uh, there will be harsh measures there. There will be the reform for the pensions, reform for the labour law, uh, liberalisation of markets and uh, privatizations. So all these issues will have to be negotiated with the Troika in the next few weeks and pass through the parliament. So it would be better, of course, to have a large majority, but uh, in any case, I think these bills will pass and uh, Greece uh, can face the first review of the Troika at the end of October. 
uh, all that laundry list you just mentioned of harsh uh, reforms that are going to have to be implemented, this sounds exactly like the stuff that Alexei Tsipras ran against back in January. Exactly. But now we have a new uh, economic constellation of uh, the situation. Right now, Greece is cut off completely from the markets. Uh, it can only obtain finance uh, from its creditors. So it has no negotiating basis. And Mr. Tsipras knows, and he has acknowledged that during the pre-election period. He said that I could not do anything else unless uh, I would uh, negotiate with, with the creditors and come to this agreement, because otherwise Greece would fall into the abyss and it would be a very bad situation for Greece. Now, he's acknowledged that there's no other way out of a bailout agreement with the creditors. This is why the uh, radical left wing of his party left and made their uh, splinter party, which failed to come into parliament. Failed to come into parliament, Francesco Saracino. Yes, I mean, this, I think uh, this is a very clear signal that the Greek people have, uh, have sent to to their politicians in the sense that they uh, clearly say that you can be against uh, the current uh, European policies and yet be in a European framework. We were discussing that actually before coming into the show. It's a, it's a very strong signal that is sent <clears throat> and it goes but to... A lot of people inside his own party saying he was a sellout. By, by agreeing to the bailout terms. Well, it turns out not not that many actually, <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, the Greek people understood that he fought as hard as he could, and the, the the agreement he got was the best he could get. And I would also would, I would like to add that it's what he got in July is not exactly what was proposed to Greece in in January. In some sense, it's true that the austerity measures he had to agree, let's call it had to agree, actually was forced to agree <laughs> in uh, July, otherwise Greece would have keep been, keep been kicked out of the euro, uh, came together with two things that Cyprus really needed at the time and really needs now and that could change the landscape in the next uh, few months or years, which are some money, because he got uh, more money than what he needs to repay. So he will have some money to spend to try to put forward its own political agenda domestically. And he got time, because the new bailout package is a three-year package, <clears throat> meaning that for the next three years he will have to, he will be able to actually do what he was planning to do without having to go back and forth from Brussels to ask money to the creditors. So he lost, he clearly lost, because the Tsipras of July is, and of September is not the Tsipras of June, but uh, I think he showed also some realism and he will try to push forward his agenda within the new framework, which is the framework that was imposed upon him. Jakob Hessler, uh, this uh, Tsipras II, uh, is he going to be radically different now? Is he going to be, well, just another center-left leader? Well, I don't know whether it's the question of being different. I, I, would, I think I agree with Francesco on that one. I think he tried hard, and he realized in a dramatic, and I remember we did talk about this here, in a dramatic game of chicken where nobody flinched until the very last second he then caved in and prevented probably a major disaster from happening. And so the question is, can he change the terms? And he already started, because when you look at, as soon as they signed the first bailout agreement, about two, three weeks later at the first credit meeting, they prolonged the repayment period. They sweetened the toughness of the European measures, which were in part also needed so that my fellow Germans didn't jump out of the window and felt that they had scored a real victory over the lazy, soi-disant lazy Greeks, which they the Germans like to feel so righteous about. So I think it's a very, it's a complex situation. I think to me the most important thing is, is that there is a clear majority and that Tsirpas is not in the opposition. I personally am like Martin Schulz. I'm very unhappy about the choice of this uh, very right-wing coalition partner when he could have had someone slightly more amenable. But then... Let, let, let's listen to him. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the president of the uh, European Parliament in Paris this Monday German Social Democrat Martin Schulz. What Tsipras did this year was really a masterpiece of political strategy. He resigns to be re-elected. 
It's politically and strategically something that you have to admire, honestly. But after the force of his exit, this renewed mandate with this far-right populist party, that I don't understand. Pierre Géromena, do you understand it? Yes, I do understand it. I must say that uh, yesterday's results were quite uh, interesting to analyze uh, both the election in itself and what it means for Greece and Europe. And I quite agree with what Martin Schulz just said this morning on a French radio. Yes, uh, Tsipras won his bet. Uh, it was a huge bet. Um, Depending on what side you... Do you think it was a bad idea to again go into coalition no. with, with the independent Greeks? What I think is that uh, Tsipras twice called the Greeks to vote this year, which is quite exceptional for a politician. And depending on what side you are, you can say that the Greeks are tired of voting, so they voted for not the best one, but the least worst one. Or they can say, you can also say that they are resigned. I don't believe so. I think that uh, he got elected. It was quite a brilliant maneuver, as uh, uh, Martin Schulz just said it. Now they have a government for four years. At least, let's hope that it will be for four years. But the very strong message that was sent to all of us yesterday, as far as I see things, is a European message. Tsipras and the Greeks said, yes, we can be Greeks, proud of our country, proud of our tradition, identity and at the very same time we can be Europeans and we want to be Europeans and we want to stay Europeans and this is exactly the message that had been sent during the referendum in July they said no to austerity but they said yes to Europe and this is very interesting because it's a message that can be explicitly, explicitly said to all the populists and nationalists that spread across all the European continent. You can be a national and you can be European at the very same time. You can be Greek, Greek and European and there is no choice to be made between Greece and Europe. And this is a very important message, especially now that Europe crosses and goes through a harsh period, we can see with the immigration problems. Yeah, and it still, needs... We still don't understand why this alliance, we didn't understand it in January, we don't understand it now. Why a, um, a party that claims to be from the hard left does an alliance with uh, a nationalist right-wing party, the independent Greeks? I, I had an explanation in January, and I think it still holds today. I'm not, I'm not sure it's true, but, uh, but I can give it to you. I mean, I, if, we, if we go back to January, uh, we can remember we had Topotami in the parliament at the time, and we had PASOK at the time. All these parties had not been sufficiently opposed in Tsipras' view, to the, for, to the former memorandum. So his choice of going with Anel was the choice of going with a party that was not against the euro, and yet who made austerity its main topic of campaign. So his, the message he sent is, that is my priority. So even if I am different from these guys on everything else, we, are, we make common front, and we are more similar on this particular aspect, which is austerity. Uh, and it's interesting, just, uh, just one second, yeah. it's interesting that seven months later, after he had to compromise, as we said before, after he was forced to come to terms with the reality, by redoing the same thing, he, he says, OK, I'm in the new framework. I downscaled a lot my pretension to change the world, but still, my battle remains the same. I think it's a very interesting thing in perspective. Whether it will succeed, that's a different story. But Yanis Koutoumidis, your reaction to the strong words we just heard from Martin Schulz, the president of the European Parliament? Well, uh, I, I personally don't think that uh, it's uh, such an uh, excellent gamble by Mr. Tsipras. Mr. Tsipras was forced to go to elections, to call elections, because he lost majority in the parliament. In the last vote for uh, the, the bailout agreement on August 14, he had to rely on uh, votes from the opposition in order to pass uh, the agreement. So it was obvious that uh, his former comrades would not go along with him for another three years. So the snap elections were a one-way street for Mr. Tsipras. On the other hand, I do understand his uh, his alliance with the independent Greeks because it's an alliance of convenience. The independent Greeks have been very nationalistic, anti-Semitic, populistic, but they have voted for every single bill 
and every single decision that Mr. Tsipras has uh, given to them, be, with one small exception of the nationality of migrants. So it's a convenient partner to have in a coalition uh, government. Pierre, Pierre Germain. I don't want to appear as the, the strong supporter of Mr. Tsipras. Um, no judgment here. But about the referendum in July, the referendum gave him the freedom of proceeding ahead without the parliament. And you will never be able to blame a politician that asks the people to vote and who is helped by his people with a vast majority of 61%. So it was a brilliant move. Y Jakob Hessler. No, I thought about this right wing thing. I think there's another explanation, a rival one or maybe a complementary one, which is that the leader of Potami is actually a rather charismatic news, former television news person. And so there is also a question of blurring the central figure potentially that Tsipras represents or wants to represent. And there would have been someone much more media savvy. Uh, visible if he had into a coalition with them rather than with someone who is so far away from him that there's no danger of any contagion or media uh, presence that he would lose. Yanis Koutsoumidis, uh, we were talking about this now, what's ahead, this third bailout plan. Uh, the Greeks have been through so much since 2000. And seven, are they ready for more when it comes to higher taxes, more privatizations? It's a, it's a very difficult moment for Greece because we're <laughs> in the middle of a recession right now. The capital controls have uh, put a lot of uh, weight and damage on the economy. And uh, there are no uh, new jobs being created. Unemployment is rising. So raising taxes right now is a big, big problem for the Greek economy and the Greek people. On the other hand, that was a decision by the government to have to close the fiscal gap that has to be closed in order to reach an agreement with the creditors. Right now, what has to be done is to the banks need to be recapitalized as soon as possible so that capital controls be lifted and the real economy gets fresh cash, fresh liquidity in order to create new business and new jobs. But it will be a very tough th uh, three months for the Greek people ahead. Ca capital controls. Just tell us, Yanis, uh, uh, what's the maximum you can withdraw from a cash machine right now? It's still 60 euros as it has been from July, the same amount. All right. When we come back, we're going to see how uh, this is going to impact the rest of Europe, the result of Sunday night's vote. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate on the heels of uh, Syriza's win in Sunday's uh, parliamentary elections, the fifth in six years for the Greeks. Uh, we're looking at the challenges that uh, Alexis Tsipras faces second time around. He's stared down the left flank of his party, those that left failing <clears throat> to even get a single seat in uh, Sunday's vote. But he, we were talking about it just before the break with our panel. Uh, the tough road ahead in implementing an 86 billion euro bailout plan. We're with uh, economist Yanis Koutsoumidis, who joins us from Athens on the day after. Also uh, here in the studio, Francesco Saracino of uh, the OFCE think tank. Uh, we're with uh, Pierre Jérôme Hénin, political and communications consultant with Media 9 or Media 9, if you're. Both work, as Both I said. Work. Okay. <laughs> Hasn't changed. And uh, uh, Jakob Hassler. Uh, entrepreneur and political uh, commentator. Uh, in the run-up uh, to the vote, uh, there was a cartoon in uh, the conservative daily uh, Katemireni by Elias Makris. Uh, there you see it. Uh, Alexei Tsipras waking up in the middle of the night, covered in sweat. I, have a, I had a nightmare, he says. What was it about, asks his half-asleep wife. I dreamed I was re-elected. Uh, he, he, he answers. Uh, we were talking about uh, him being a genius uh, before the before the break. <laughs> Yanis Koutsoumidis, is there some truth to that cartoon? Uh, is uh, his legacy now going to be entirely different this second time around? 
Uh, of course, we, we cannot make any comparison with the dramatic situation uh, of uh, June and July, although there are tough measures ahead. Uh, he has the, the task to uh, convince the Greek people for a more relaxed labor law, for uh, privatizations of uh, state assets, and of uh, the most uh, sensitive part is the cuts in the pension system. This will affect hundreds and thousands and millions of Greeks who will see less money in the pockets at the end of each month. And these are uh, things that Mr. Tsipras will have to convince the Greek people that they have to endure in order for the country to come out of this crisis and the economy to recover again. Yanis, uh, let me ask you a personal question. Back in January, when Syriza was elected, the whole continent watched because here was this new party where you could agree or not with their policies, but at least it was a breath of fresh air compared to the stale old uh, uh, politics uh, that we had seen before. And the, did you have the sense at the time that this really could change the boundaries when it comes to how do you negotiate things like austerity policies? Uh, I was I was very reluctant uh, in uh, to Mr. Tsipras because I had uh, read and I had seen what uh, he was supposed to do in uh, the brinkmanship with the European Union was in his speeches and in the comments of his advisers many months ahead. So we saw this tragic this drama coming in uh, at least in uh, until June, but we didn't expect that there was not a plan B. He was, uh, he was saying all the time that he had a plan B and he will stay in the European uh, Monetary Union. But we saw at the last moment there was no plan B and it was just a decision he made on a very dramatic night in Brussels. Francesco Saracino, are you disappointed when you look back at the last nine months? Uh, mildly. <laughs> I'm more disappointed from, by, by the, from the behavior of the European partners. Uh, Cyprus did what he could. Uh, with the, I mean, I agree. The, the when we discovered that there wasn't a plan B, we were kind of uh, surprised. I mean, when, you know, it was really a bluff. He was um, when the bluff was called, uh, so that is, was a surprise. But I'm not disappointed. I mean, he had an agenda. He was alone. He had some. He made some, some mis tactical mistakes. That this is all happening in the context of a crisis that started in 2007. It doesn't just concern Greece, by No, the exactly. Way. That's, it that's concerns the all of Europe. So, what I would and there was, hey, here's this party that's going to have an anti-austerity message that perhaps is a little different, and may, perhaps we can try. Exactly. So, I mean, you, you, inv you invited me many, many times, so you know uh, what I think of current U European policies. So what I hoped in January was not so much that, that he would change European politics, we have to be realistic, but that he would trigger debate, discussion, and movement in other countries. And that didn't happen. A little bit because he was not, he was a bit clumsy in his approach at the very beginning. He was a bit arrogant mm -hmm. in the first few months. And, and these we can hope. To. And in the negotiation, he made a few mistakes. So the sort of brilliance, once you survive, I'm not sure whether brilliant is the thing. He also, you could say, was really lucky at some points. Because in the European negotiations, at some point, he managed to to alienate the two, three people who were about to try to help him, which were at the time Christine Lagarde and Jean-Claude Juncker, he managed to, in private, turn them around, said they would help him, and the next morning accused them of the worst things you could ever imagine, thereby personally driving them away. And now you can say, with hindsight, maybe it was right. But it was a huge gamble. And he probably could have gotten the same but result with slightly yeah. less But it wasn't drama. just, and by the way, it wasn't just the, the Germans showing him tough love. It was, and this was surprising, the countries that had to take their medicine, like Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, were also uh, showing, it uh, seems... That, that, is, that, is, uh, that, that is exactly the point. I mean, he made mistakes, I agree with you. He alienated potential allies. Uh, it remains the fact that there was an opportunity to be seized. And I'm thinking of the two largest Could he have built a coalition countries. with southern European countries? I'm thinking of France and Italy, actually. And France and Italy moved too late and too little. So Hollande and Renzi were somehow uh, crucial in not having the, 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 the disaster happen in July, but they should have moved earlier and tried to broker a different compromise. So 
the, the big disappointment for me is that there was no, nobody in Europe ready to take the witness and to help Tsipras, also by checking some of his arrogant behaviors and keeping them down. And that was, that was the big disappointment. He did what he could. Pierre Jérôme Menard, are you, are, you, are you disappointed in France in the way they, they reacted to this crisis? No, well, I, I just want to bounce back on what you just said um, about the fact that no one, no other country would help Greece at a time when it, when it needed help. It raises a very important issue. Uh, what is this European project today? What do we want to do together? And um, I think it is time with the Greek crisis, with the migration crisis, for the heads of state or government to sit around a table once for all and to say very precisely what do we want to do together? What is the European project? There's a lack of political will which is extremely bad for the European construction. The second thing I wanted to say um, is that Mr. Tsipras now, as it has been stated from Athens, uh, will be judged on his ability and the ability of his government to implement the reforms that are dramatically needed in Greece, thinking about the tax reforms, thinking about the labor market reform, thinking about uh, the land register, etc., etc. Uh, on this point, uh, Jakob Hessler, um, the, uh, the, the Greek prime minister, he didn't have um, a, a lot of friends before. Is he going to have more now? Well, I don't know if politics is a matter of friends. Um, I think it's, that's maybe an idealistic view. I think he should, as any politician who has a large majority or a significant majority behind him, should be respected by saying this is a democracy, he has an agenda, he set out what he's going to do, so we need to respect and expect that he'll do what he set out he was going to do. And it is true, and I remember that was one of the debates we had here one before time, was that all the predecessor parties, be they left or right wing, never attacked any of the underlying structural problems. So how can you expect that one guy in three months since he gets elected, now I'm not saying he's going to do it well and he's the best to do it, it's just that did any of the conservative majorities in the past attack the problem of taxes, of the outrageously uh, unjust uh, distribution of incomes in the public sector between people who get nearly nothing, which is uh, basically teachers and um, nurses in hospitals are very badly paid and others get dream salaries that are higher than the ones you get in France and in Germany. All these things were known for 10, 15, 20 years. Everyone knew it. We knew it, and Europe never did anything. And we should at least be sufficiently fair and say, OK, well, now he has a crack at it, and we should respect, now give him some time to get a crack at it. Because it's true, nobody before him even tried. Yanis mean, Koutsoumidis, how far is he going to go on this? Well, uh, we really have to see because he hasn't been very open in the pre-election period on which parts of the bailout agreement he wants to renegotiate or to revise. He said he wants to have a parallel social program that will offset the negative side of the bailout uh, agreement. But to, to come to your previous discussion, Mr. Tsipras, despite, uh, although he did attack the austerity since January, he wasn't very keen in implementing reforms that would make the Greek economy more competitive. He was very reluctant in uh, uh, making the, the public sector more uh, efficient. He was very reluctant in any like, privatizations. Like any, so anyone. we have to see if he's now ready to go in a new path. But we've seen a different Mr. Tsipras since the July 13 agreement. Uh, I, I remember that between July 13 and August 14, when we had the agreement for the bailout, there were fast and very efficient negotiations between the, the, prime, the finance minister, Mr. Tsakalotos, and the Troika. So I think it's a matter of political will. If Mr. Tsipras wants to push ahead with serious reforms, I think he can do it. All right, back in July, when uh, the, the Greeks organized that referendum we were talking about, uh, we, we looked at uh, the criticism that came from the rest of the continent. In Germany, some of the harshest criticism came not from the conservative chancellor or her finance minister, 
But, and this surprised some at the time, from junior coalition partner Zygmar Gabriel. He's the leader of the Social Democrats. The Greek government did not continue to negotiate these far-reaching offers and instead chose a different path because they did not want to attach their own reform program to a possible third aid program. They wanted to get aid, but they were not willing to accept the reforms needed to receive it. Hearing that tough love from the Social Democrats, for those of us who are not German, uh, it surprised people because there was the idea, this is the Social Democrats, they're from the left. Why? Why? What happened? I think the number one factor is, is that Sigmar Gabriel is a loose cannon, which is, I think, one of the key reasons why he'll never become chancellor. He is just, he acts too much out of the spur of the moment and then... Some so his views are not that of his party or...? I, well, I don't think they reflect necessarily the view of the majority of the people in his party. Now, in the broader scheme, the Germans overall are much, much more skeptical, held by quality newspapers like Bild Zeitung. They have really learned how terribly bad people uh, the Greeks are. And, and, I, and I said it before, I think the Germans have this obsession with this debt. And the notion of debt, that is the same word as guilt, they are obsessed that if you have a debt, if you have a guilt, you have to pay for it. And even if it makes no economic sense, and I'm talking about mainstream economics, I'm not talking about any of the sort of r hardcore left wing or whatever else we want. Even if it makes no economic sense, there is a moral righteousness about why they want this. And Sigmar Gabriel expressed exactly that. But it's not just the Germans. No. And, we, and, and, these, and the idea of being from the left, but also bending over backwards to say you're pro-market, uh, that's, that's throughout Northern Europe. But to go back to what you just said, and you mentioned Bild, uh, the newspaper, uh, politicians will never win against their public opinion. And remember what were the polls, what were the polls saying about uh, the Greek situation in Germany. Yeah. So this is also a part of an explanation why Zygmar Gabriel said uh, such thing. To go back to, to Tsipras, you said, should he be respected? Of course he should be respected, and we're not talking from f one friend to the other. He, was, he went three times for the elections, two general elections, one referendum. Just for that, he should be respected, and he's the guy the others are going to have to talk to for the next four years. But his shift to the center-left, this is the interesting bit. There was a column in the Financial Times by Wolfgang Munchau, where he said the only Keynesian party in Germany today is Die Linke, which <laughs> derives from the former communists of East Germany. In Italy and France, the Keynesians are on the extreme left and the extreme right. Would center-left parties do better if they shifted back to the left? Francesco Saracino. Yes, I mean, this, this is exactly what uh, I think makes the strength of Tsipras. And, and what I said when we began the, our conversation, uh, it seems that there is a real demand for radical left, where radical, in fact, means just social democrat, because the so-called moderate left in France, in Italy, in Germany, in all the major countries, in, in, in Spain, has become so close to the center. And this was the point Munchau was making this morning on the Financial Times. I, I actually made it on my blog when Syriza was elected. He's not a radical. If you look at his platform, that's a Keynesian platform that would have been mildly social democrat in the 70s and 80s. So uh, the, this shift of the traditional left towards the center made room for a radical left that is in fact not so radical that can go back and take some of the keywords of uh, the, the traditional left uh, equality uh, efficient in government intervention and they underline the word efficient and we go back to greece which is far from being efficient and so on and so forth uh, and by the way <coughs> you were not so fair with one of the governments that uh, that uh, preceded Tsipras, which is george papandreou because papandreou yes, actually another, yeah. tried yeah, to he do try, and he got very busted. similar things to what yeah. Tsipras did. And he was busted he with, was busted. with the because help was... of Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Sarkozy, who mm -hmm. basically dropped him in the hands of Venizelos. And so, uh, All right, but, but to get to this crisis here, uh, we have uh, this uh, sort in Britain, we had new labor, and we've seen it uh, pushed out 
uh, t 10 days ago uh, with uh, the election of Jeremy Corbyn, an old school socialist. Uh, here in France, we have the Socialist Party, which is in the doldrums if you look at the polls. Um, the the center left, one of the big criticisms, Yanis Koutsoumidis, is that when this financial crisis hit in 2007, 2008, the center left was unable to tack anything other than this new labor like stance. Do you agree? Well, uh, the, the, there is some uh, good argument there, but I have to, to point out that you can be as radical as you want as long as the bond markets uh, <laughs> leave you uh, space to become radical. Because we see now in many uh, countries of the Euro periphery that they can maintain a stable fiscal environment as long as the ECB is uh, going into the QE and there is the, the decision of uh, Mr. Draghi of 2012 for the OMT that changed the whole uh, atmosphere in uh, the Euro crisis. So we have to keep in our minds that we can attack austerity as much as we want but the markets are out there and if we are not not uh, fiscally sound and uh, we have, don't have a credibility in our fiscal system, then the new crisis could arise. So it's a true So you're saying, Yanis, that uh, elected being... officials, you're saying elected officials, uh, at the end of the day, they don't have the final say. The man with the final say is uh, no. the, uh, the president of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. No. Uh, when you don't, when you cannot control uh, the the finances of your state, and you have a big deficit, and you need to refinance your debt every year with hundreds of billions of euros, then you have to have a sound system, a sound fiscal system that can maintain this pace of refinancing. I'm not saying that austerity is good, but uh, the credibility, I think, has to be there in order to maintain a more sound fiscal system. What, what I think is, and, and that's I think where, I don't know whether we disagree, but where I think austerity, we're confusing austerity as a macroeconomic concept or the absence of one with the fact that many countries like France have archaic systems and structures that prevent it from growth. And I think where we yeah, are. But come on, Jacob. I know, yeah, but 2007 that, 8, we have this huge financial crisis. Yeah, but the Instead problem, of nationalizing banks, they, they bail them out. Yeah, and but we're, we're not. Yeah, but nationalizing to, banks doesn't solve the problem of creating yeah. jobs. Jobs are created by entrepreneurs and by companies that have access to money, that have access to skilled labor, that they can employ under contracts that are fair between the people who work and the people who employ them, and that they have structures in which they don't pay for. So for services that are not needed, where they don't pay for a part of the government that, that, that is not needed. And all of these things are not linked directly to austerity, which is that in a time of crisis, you just screw all that you tighten all the screws so much that you choke the economy, which if you go back to Greece, where uh, now you have a tax increase of VAT, at the same time, somebody is dreaming or trying to revive the economy. That is just macroeconomically nonsense. Even if you're for or against, see, see, see what I mean? You can be a very pro-business person and say we need a sound public financial system and I think we need that and still be against austerity in the way it's implemented today because it's just a narrow-minded way of choking the economy and that can be in no one's interest. Francesco Sassino. We've come to a surprise to you but I tend to agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, I, 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 I totally agree. I mean there is this mix which is the really little uh, cocktail that we had in Europe since 2010 that austerity and structural reform proceeded together. The result was that by choking the economy, we made, where they were implemented, reforms ineffective. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, I remember a very great paper. Uh, I asked my students to read it every time. It was written back in 2013 by the uh, Turkish economist uh, Danny Roderick, yes. who said sequencing <laughs> is crucial. Sequencing <laughs> in reforms is, is crucial. Structural reforms in bad time kill the economy and fail. Structural reforms in good times have a problem of having the incentive for governments to do them because, of course, in good time you have a problem of incentives, but they're more effective. Now, if you have a problem implementing the structural reform in good times, the solution that was found so far is you implement it in bad time. That was the wrong solution. You have to, to find ways to implement them in good times, to put in place the incentive for governments to do that at the right moment. Doing a good policy at the, at the wrong moment is just.
playing stupid. All right, that Sorry, is, the, we're, we're going to leave it there, Fran Francesco Saracino. <laughs> the earpiece falling out is, I guess, our cue. <laughs> Many thanks. I want to thank Jakob Hessler. I also want to thank Pierre Giromena. Also, uh, Yanis Koutsouminis for being with us from Athens. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And the debate continues in the company of James Creedon. How are you, sir? Very well, Francois. Just a quick look at the Greek uh, papers and uh, the editorials this morning, uh, which seem to be pretty much in favour of the uh, the result of the election. Avgi, which is a left-leaning daily, and uh, now let's go down to work, was the, the headline. This is the website, but the headline of the paper this morning was that. The winner of this election is the people which prevented a return to the recent impasse and managed to hold on to hope. So it all seems a little bit, you know, words being bandied around, not, not, really, deba not really debating the, the actual policies, but uh, hopeful sort of rhetoric. The losers are those who wanted to reduce Tsipras's government to a parenthesis, uh, those whose interests are in maintaining corruption and economic bankruptcy. Meanwhile, uh, E-Tipos, uh, their headline this morning was, this is the last chance for the country and for Tsipras. Uh, the centre-right daily, Katamarini, it says uh, that the train line has now been set and from today Mr Tsipras will be driving that train along a track that has already been predetermined but that there will almost certainly be further challenges within Parliament and within Greek society uh, and the prospect of a Grexit will once again have to be confronted. Uh, meanwhile, Tanea says that, er, is saying that this is the Tsipras era. Uh, it's a personal triumph for him. He's a fine tactician. His talent also, when it comes to defining a longer-term strategy, is is uh, is there to see, and they speak about an electorate that is tired. With there was no excessive enthusiasm, uh, but it decided to give him a second chance. And just finally, um, Tovima, uh, they say that voters showed in a clear manner that in their eyes, Mr. Tsipras. Uh, has their, uh, is expressing their interests and that he has their trust. He can go forward to govern with determination and efficiency. So it, a lot of it just seems to be confirming uh, that uh, there is there is a degree of fatigue and that people seem to think that Tsipras is the best And interesting, option. the point you make about how uh, a gre Grexit or no Grexit is not off the table. Uh, pierre Jérôme Mena, uh, it's something that will have to be confronted again, perhaps, uh, down the line if, if things don't go well. We didn't talk about it, but... 500,000 people in this election voted for a neo-Nazi party, uh, which got 7% mm. golden dawn. I don't think that, I don't hope that the Brexit will come back on the table. And I especially don't think so, because coming back to what we said earlier, I think that the Greek people have sent a very strong European message once again yesterday. And they clearly said, we want to be Greeks, we are proud of being Greeks, but we also want to remain Europeans, we want to stay in the Eurozone. So I don't think that the Grexit issue will come back on the table, and I certainly do not hope so. Yeah, Jakob Hasser, you agree? I agree. And it's a good day for Europe? I think it's a good day for Europe, yes. And it's a good day against all, once again, populism, populism and yes. nationalism. We have a strong answer to give to them. You can remain a national and still at the very same time be European. What better answer could we have? All right, I want to thank our panel. Thank you, James, as well. And thank you for joining us here for the France 24 debate.